Um, in this room, we are going to meet our founder, James Smithson. Have any of y'all heard of James mm -hmm. Smithson before? Yeah. Did you also know that he wasn't American? He was British? No. Yeah, so he wasn't American. He was born in 1765 uh, to, to a well-to-do well -to -do parents. His father's name was Hugh Smithson, and his mother, uh, who came from, from um, nobility, and his mother's name was uh, Elizabeth Hungerford Keat Macy, who actually came from royalty. She descended from George I. Uh, his parents were not married. They actually never were married, so he was considered out of wedlock, which at the time was very controversial. And to add to that controversy, his father was actually married to his mother's first cousin. So you can imagine, it's a little bit of a soap opera right out of the gate. Um, he wasn't married in England, he was married in Paris, France. And we don't know too much about his childhood, but we do know by the time he was around eight or nine years old, he was back in England as a naturalized citizen. Now, because he was born out of wedlock, his father did not recognize him, and he never recognized him through his entire life, uh, which was really a defining uh, factor in Smithson's life. He really strived to get his, his father's recognition. Um, and because he was considered illegitimate, he, he really didn't have the advantages that most uh, people of nobility, even though he had money, um, and came from two very good families, that, that normal people who were born um, within wedlock had at that time. In spite of that, he was a very good student, and he studied at uh, Pembroke College at Oxford University. He studied, he studied uh, chemistry and mineralogy, so he was a science guy, and he was very good at it. To the point where by the time he finished college, he was the youngest member to join the Royal Society, which was a very prestigious scientific organization in England at that time. Um, and really from then on, he made science his life. He devoted his life. Um, to, to having science better the common good, really, um, and better the public. Um, he traveled all throughout Europe and all throughout England and the United Kingdom, although he never traveled to the United States. You'll want to remember that. Um, and, he, and he wrote papers on anything from discovering new minerals, which we actually have in this case right here. Uh, this was a new mineral that he discovered, which we now call smithsonite. Um, it's actually calcium carbonate, and I do have a sample right here, which I'm going to pass around. <coughs> quite beautiful. Um, and he also wrote papers as common as the best way to make coffee. So he really thought about science all the time. Uh, and he really made it an adventure of his life. Like I said, he traveled all throughout Europe. And during the Napoleonic Wars, he was actually accused of being a spy and imprisoned for two and a half years. Uh, fortunately, he was eventually pardoned and released from prison. Um, in 1801, shortly after his mother died, he was still going by the name of his mother's last name, Macy. So shortly after his mother died in 1801, his father had already passed away. He changed his name to Smithson. And we have a little joke around here that if he, if he hadn't done that, he'd be coming to Macy's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and we're not sure why he changed his name to Smithson. Um, we don't know if it was against his mother's wishes or if it was one of her final dying wishes. Um, but him declaring his, his, his actual birth lineage was a very big deal to do at that point. Like I said, he was, he was basically publicly de declaring his illegitimacy. Um, so uh, throughout his life, as he was getting older, um, and he, he never married and never had any children. Um, but he did accrue quite amount of, an amount of wealth, uh, mainly through an inheritance from his mother, as well as he made some really wise investments. We have some pretty good bank records um, for him to reflect this. And so when he was getting older and becoming ill, he uh, decided to make a will. Uh, and he wrote his own will, which at the, com at the time was very uncommon. Uh, and in the will, he left his fortune to his closest living relative, which was his nephew. And mainly the, the fortune would go to his nephew and his nephew's unborn children. His nephew was really just a child at the time. Um, he did put this one small clause in the will um, that in the event his nephew would not uh, have any children, legitimate or illegitimate, that um, he would leave his inheritance to the United States of America to found at Washington, and I'm reading this on the wall because I can never remember it, um, under the name of, uh, of the Smithsonian Institution an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. That's the only mention that he has in his will of living in here to the United States. So it came to be quite a conundrum later on, as you can imagine. 
Uh, I'm going to continue this story in the next room. Uh, and this is the actual uh, grave marker that was in the original uh, grave site of James Smithson. Um, shortly after he created his will, his will in 1826, he moved to France. Um, and then when he started growing older and, and more ill, he actually made a trip down to Genoa, Italy for his health, where in 1829 he grew ill and passed away. Uh, you see a photo up here on the, on the upper left side of the case. That's the photo of the original grave site in Genoa. It's in a Protestant cemetery. Um, his nephew, whom he left the fortune to, had this, uh, this grave marker made. And you see the, inscri in the inscription, um, in memory of James Smithson, a fellow of the Royal Society, who died at Genoa the 26th of June, 1829. That is the correct date, um, aged 75. That's not his correct age, unfortunately. He was actually 64 when he, was, when he passed away. So this is telling us, we think, that while his, him and his nephew probably had a very good relationship, they probably didn't know each other very well. Uh, and so at the time of his death, his, his nephew was uh, a young teenager uh, in good health and presum presumably would marry and have children. Well, in 1835, uh, when he was just about 23, he himself, while traveling in Italy, grew ill and passed away, with no heirs, legitimate or illegitimate. So that's when that small clause in his will kicks in and the money goes to the United States. Um, I'm going to continue that in just a moment, but I'm going to point a few other things in this room. Uh, if you look at the case here, over, um, you see some photos of, of something that happened Pretty, pretty fast later, in 1904, well after the Smithsonian Institution is established and renowned, um, the, the original grave site, they were going to repurpose the land. And so they contacted the Smithsonian Board of Regents and asked if they wanted his remains. And so they decided that they did, and they sent a representative over to Italy to collect his remains. Um, and that representative was Alexander Graham Bell. Do you know who he is? What do you do? Right, you met on the telephone. So these photos were actually taken by Graham Bell's wife. Um, and as I mentioned at the top, you have the original grave site. And then you have some photos of, of uh, his remains arriving in Washington, D.C. at Navy Yard, which isn't too far from here. You have the boat coming into port. And then you have a processional here with the casket uh, in us, draped with the Union Jack flag, the British flag. And then next to it, you see the casket lying in repose in the Regent's room, which is just upstairs in this building. And that's when they lay the American flag over it to welcome him to his new home. Uh, after, he, after the remains uh, arrived here, they needed to decide what exactly to do with them. You couldn't exactly give tours like I do. Uh, so they had a few uh, designs drawn up of what possible memorial they could build. The one at the top, had it been realized, the top right, um, would be larger than the Lincoln Memorial is today. I know some of you said that you, that you saw the Lincoln Memorial, so if you can imagine, that was pretty big. Um, ultimately, they decided the best place for him was here at the Smithsonian, and so they had this room, which was a former broom closet, repurposed and brought um, his remains here. He was put in a nice new mahogany coffin, and, and he lies um, just below in this um, marble portion of the memorial. Um, his remains were only exhumed one time in the 70s, and that's what's really, uh, we had some scientists over from natural history come and do some tests, figure out if we know a little bit more about him. Um, he was about my height, so about 5'6", um, had an athletic build, but something had happened in his childhood where they, something affected his bones. Um, and actually, we have um, documentation from his friends and colleagues that said he was a bit of a, like, um, he was pretty sickly, maybe a bit of a hypochondriac even. Um, and he did, he, he did smoke a pipe based on the way his teeth were, and he probably smoked it with his left hand. Um, and that portrait we have up there was, was painted around the time he was about 50 years old, and that's the best likeness we have of him. Um, another thing in this room, um, you see the plaque in the photo of the original grave site. That original plaque is lost. We have a uh, copy made of marble, which is right over here. And then in this other corner of the room, we have some of his belongings. Unfortunately, all the possessions that we had of Smithson 
uh, were destroyed in a fire that took place in this building in 1865. So we still really don't know too much about him. Um, these are some of the few remaining things we have, some books, a painting, um, but one of the coolest things I think we have is his calling card, which is something he would bring around to, when he went to visit his friends and colleagues, um, to announce his, his uh, presence at the house, and that's actually in his own handwriting. Does anybody have any questions so far about Mr. Smithson? All right, cool. Um, we are going to go back into the Great Hall um, at this point, so if you all want to meet Yeah, so we should do this and then do the cafe.